like an example of some ants. Ants have the task of, uh, they have to find food, and they have to find good food for that anthill. Uh, they don't know where it is, they have to sort of explore it. And so when they start out, ants sort of randomly go all over the place looking for food. But once they start finding food, they lay a pheromone trail. And then the other ants listen to the, they smell the pheromone trail of the others, and ones which look like they're doing well, they start following them. And if enough ants go on the same trail, pretty soon they're all going on it. And so if an ant finds a really good source of food, it gets the whole colony going there. But there's competition. If there are two sources of food, the one that is stronger will pull more ants to it. That makes that trail stronger. And in that way, the anthill does a kind of cognition in searching for, the, for its kind of food. And there's a general algorithm which seems to be used at all levels and all scales in biology. Uh, you can sort of say it in shorthand as that which is successful gets strengthened, that which is not gets eliminated. And so this applies at the level of natural selection and evolution, applies in development, it applies to ecosystems, the way they adjust themselves to economies. Companies go out of business if they're not producing something that people want. Uh, beehives and anthills make their decision this way. Our immune system, you know, the um, T cells replicate if they're successful at um, dealing with an antigen, they replicate, you get more and more of those. The guys which aren't doing anything, they uh, eventually die off and kill themselves. Uh, brains work this way. Neurons strengthen their connections according to Hebrew. Um, that which fire, you know, neurons which fire together, wire together is a sort of a shorthand for that. Animal physiology, if you use a bone or a muscle more, it gets strengthened. Uh, cell physiology does the same thing. And so this sort of, this is a general principle, a general rule for, for by which uh, biological systems can very uh, inexpensively update themselves to adapt to whatever environment they find themselves in. So let's go through um, the way evolution works and uh, see how some of these things arise. The standard evolutionary model uh, is that the diversity, the source of, so in, in evolution we're trying to create creatures which are better adapted to a, a given environment. So maybe we're fish swimming in the ocean and there's a certain kind of algae we eat and um, we'd like to change ourselves so that we swim better and we find the algae better and we eat it better and we digest it better. That's the kinds of changes that the system would like to make. And the standard evolutionary explanation for how that happens is that the diversity comes from random changes in the genome. So cosmic rays come in and flip uh, some of the, the nucleic acids and crossovers for, for species that reproduce sexually. The genomes from the mother and the father um, cross over and you get, you, know, you get a combination of the two. And um, once we've mutated or changed the genome, the genome gives rise to the phenotype, which is the body, the shape and the form of the animal. Um, that that uh, body goes out and lives, does its thing, swims around, tries to get food. Um, nature selects which of these um, th does the best, you know, which one gets enough food to eat, which ones don't, which ones starve. And the ones which survive the best have more offspring, and the whole thing repeats. You can sort of see that the, the, the selection is this process of that which is doing best gets, uh, gets amplified. And so it's a um, you know, very simple algorithm, and you know, people have been arguing and thinking about it ever since Darwin, it's Darwin's 200th birthday uh, recently. Um, from a computer science point of view, it's a really slow algorithm, because most of these totally random mutations are going to be in critical proteins in your, your genome. You're gonna, if you just randomly change bits of your DNA, most of it is going to produce results where you don't function at all. And so uh, it's a pretty slow process for trying to improve yourself. So I thought for years there must be a lot more going on than this. It turns out the rate of evolution is much more rapid than people thought. Uh, Darwin did a lot of his studies on the Galapagos Islands where these finches were, were uh, flying around, and the, the finches had it adapted to the niches that in other places other birds had. And uh, he was struck by, you know, there were finches with curved beaks and finches with long beaks and finches with short wings, all that kind of thing. Well, some people went and studied what, what the bird populations looked like on the Galapagos Islands over a period of 20 years. And they discovered that the, in that 20 year period, dramatic amounts of evolution took place. So people used to think, if you just look at this, the process seems like it should be incredibly slow. Very, very slow random mutations over a long, long period may gradually change. The uh, most recent evidence is, in fact, that, that evolutionary change happens much, much faster. In fact, the Human Genome Project has just discovered that uh, human genomes from 5,000 years ago were closer to Neanderthal than they were to us. And so it appears that over the past 10,000 years, we've undergone rapid, rapid change uh, as, as humans. In fact, 10,000 years ago, there was nobody with blue eyes. And so uh, I couldn't have existed. So the biologists are starting to discover um, more intricate mechanisms which enable uh, evolution to go uh, much more rapidly. 
And the first is that many animals don't just have random mutations. That in fact, uh, several species of bacteria have been found that when they're stressed, they're put in an environment where they don't have the food they need, or the temperature's too high, or it's too acidic. They don't make random changes to their genome. They, they selectively mutate those parts of the genome that code for things that are, are relevant to the stress. And so uh, it would make sense that ordinary Darwinian selection would select for that kind of uh, capability because it could dramatically speed things up. But it's been found in, in several cases. It's a, a nice book that sort of summarizes some of that. Um, Another interesting uh, uh, effect, something called the Baldwin effect, it was actually discovered 100 years ago, uh, and it was very controversial for many years, but uh, recently um, artificial life and artificial intelligence people started doing simulations, and they found that the effect is actually very strong and significant. And the basic idea of it is, imagine that we're trying to do evolution of creatures that learn. So a creature that learns, um, part of what it does in the world is built into it um, in its genome, but part of it, it, it discovers by either experimenting or watching its parent or something like that. And imagine you have a creature which learns. Think about the evolutionary pressure on that creature. If, it is, if a, a variant, a mutation is born, which has, is a little bit further along the path that it was going to have to learn, then it's going to lear, learn more easily and more quickly. And so the fact that it learns applies pressure that tends to push the evolutionary path along the path that it learned. And so you start with creatures that learn some behavior, and after some number of generations, you end up with having, having creatures which are born already knowing that behavior. So it's sort of a mechanism whereby what used to be learned comes to be sort of downloaded into the genome. Uh, an amazing and powerful uh, thing that looks sort of Lamarckian. It looks like, gee, something that my parent discovered somehow now is passed on to the child. But it's a standard Darwinian selection mechanism for, by which that can happen. Uh, I invented a, a, a variant of that, which is the same, same issue, except not about learning, it's about deliberation. Imagine that you have creatures which can think about the world and reason about what actions they want to take. What pressure does that apply to natural selection? Well, uh, imagine particularly the question of what mate to choose. You know, if the weather's getting cold and you start looking around, you say, well, somebody who's, you know, got more fur or is, uh, you know, better suited to that might make a better mate. That conscious choice, that thinking in your brain, is now suddenly in a few generations reflected in the genome. And so one of the standard things people say about evolution is it can't look ahead. That evolution only sort of respond to what has already happened. But in fact, it can create creatures which can look ahead. And once you have creatures which can look ahead, that puts pressure on, on the evolutionary process so that evolution actually looks ahead. Um, another very hot area these days is something sometimes called evo devo which is um, the interaction between evolution and development. And so uh, when a creature is born as a single cell, it evolves uh, into, a, I mean, it, it uh, develops into a full creature. Um, some simple animals, like uh, one of the worms, uh, the, the, the process by which development happens is totally fixed. But for sophisticated animals like us, um, it's actually very, very plastic. And so the, the shape of our muscles and our bones and our nervous systems depend on the environment, what we, what we encounter as we're during development. And so in particular, when the brain hooks up to the muscles, it actually sends out three times as many neurons as we're ultimately going to need. The neurons which hook up to a muscle get strengthened, according to that rule. The ones which don't find anything to hook up to, they die off. And so we actually have this massive period of die off where uh, two thirds of our neurons going out to, going out to our muscles uh, disappear. You might say, well, why? That seems like a weird, seems like a lot of waste to get rid of those. But in fact, it makes the whole system extremely robust. So sometimes there are mutations in which people often, or, or more often animals, have extra limbs. So here's a picture of a, of a deer which has actually six legs. And what's remarkable is that extra limbs work. That the, because the developmental process is designed to be so plastic and responsive to what's there, there's an extra leg. There'll be some neurons which find that leg and hook up to it. A part of the brain will be developed to control that. The, the vascular system will send blood to that leg. The muscles will hook up in all the right way. You get, an extra, you get a creature with six legs, even though in the evolutionary history, this has never been seen before. So it's an amazing sort of meta-evolutionary uh, process that the structure allows much more sophisticated change to happen than, than just the standard uh, evolutionary process. 